said God cannot lie. He promised to save his people. He never changed his mind. Today he still calls them my people. My people. My people. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. As we continue in our study of our, our look at the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. This is our 24th session wow. in this study. And uh, this session should be the conclusion of our look at the sixth church, the Church of Philadelphia. I want to remind you that all of the prior studies in this uh, are available on Bible Talk on the website and will remain there for as long as the Lord wills. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we're going to pick it up where we left off. We, we had finished last week in verse 11, chapter 3, verse 11 in the book of Revelation. So we're going to start at verse 12. But before we do that, my brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing upon our gathering, our time, and his word. Hallelujah. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we Amen. thank you for your spirit, which is always with us. Yeah. And it says in your word, where two or three gathered are gathered, you are among us. So, Lord, make yourself known and quicken our spirit and let our mind be receptive to what you have. Amen. Amen. And don't you forget to test everything that you hear here. That's right. You know, it says in Jeremiah 17, Cursed is a man who trusts in mankind and flesh. Don't, <clears throat> don't take my word for anything or what we have to say here. Test it. Check it out in the Word of God and see if it's not so. Because at the end of the day, it's not what I say or Alice or Mark that matters. It's what you hear from the Lord that doesn't just go into your mind, it goes into your heart. Because as it says in Romans 10, it's with the heart man believes. So I just want to admonish you to do, do that. that. Yes. Don't <clears throat> trust me. Hallelujah. Revelation 3.12 he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Hmm. That's what Jesus has to say towards the end of this letter. He who overcomes. He who overcomes. Now, every letter that we've looked at, in all the letters, it's written, and Jesus, you know, the admonishment, the instruction is, he who overcomes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing is, it's kind of line upon line, precept upon precept. Right. So I think our understanding should build and grow as we go through the letters. Yes. Because that, that statement is a consistent part of what the Lord has said to all of the churches. And it is. It's a warning, an admonition. It's an instruction. It's training in righteousness. But here, in the letter to Philadelphia, I think there's something really interesting. And it's because he's just told them to hold fast to what they have. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk about overcoming. You know, it's the adversary who comes as a thief mm -hmm. to steal what believers have. Yes. All right? So you got to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. All right? The joy of the Lord. <laughs> well, it, it's true. I mean, yes. You know, it's... Uh, we travel in a lot of places, and then, you know, as you're traveling, they tell you, don't, you know, make sure you hold on to, get your, make sure your valuables are Secure, away, because yeah. we go to a lot of places where pickpocketing and thievery is mm -hmm. pretty rampant. The devil is a thief. Yes. That's what Jesus said, right? And he wants to steal what you have that truly is of value. But you have to remember that he has, I, he has no power to forcibly take any spiritual thing that we have. Because he's been disarmed. He has power. And, and I want to I want to read that. But you see, he has to kind of, I've, I've always said this, and I've probably, if you've watched our Bible studies, you've probably heard me say this at some point. He's a thief, but he's a very particular type of thief. He's a con man. Because he doesn't have the power to take from you. He has to con you into you giving him what you have. Right. That's what he did with Adam and Eve, right? Right. He didn't bonk anybody on the head and take it, right? So, but God says of his enemies, 
This is from Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And then he says of us, he says, the believer, he says, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Luke 10, that's verses 18 and 19. I, 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 There's nothing to pick up. I'm, I'm troubled, actually. Mm -hmm. As you know, as we have traveled around the world sharing, preaching, and teaching, and, and I see so many Christians involved in, in ministries are going to be ministered to, you know, because they're so always confessing their fear mm -hmm. of what the enemy might do. That's right. You know, it's like they're trembling in front of... You know when you tremble in front of the enemy? David said it in, in uh, Psalm 55. He said when he listened to the voice of the enemy. That's, that's when he began to tremble. That's when he, he, when he paid attention. It's not just when you hear him, but if you choose to receive what he's saying to you. All right? How, how fearful was David when he went out onto the battlefield with Goliath? Not at all. Not at all. Why? I mean, you know, it, it, the people of God... In that instance, you know, in the Valley of Allah, in the, which you probably all know, David and Goliath, right. the story of David and Goliath, the people of God were all fearful. They were trembling. For 40 days, they were there trembling every time Goliath walked out onto the battlefield. David comes along, and he looks, and he's like, he, you know, what is this guy? Yeah. Who is this guy that he should challenge the God of Israel? That's right. The difference was all of the people were looking at the natural. And seeing how much bigger Goliath was than them. Right. David looked at Goliath and saw how much smaller Goliath was than David's God. That's right. And it's all about your attitude. If that's the attitude you have, you will understand the authority and the power that God has given us. And then you will walk in like Paul. No matter what, what the devil does. And that doesn't mean he's not going to attack. No. But no matter what the devil does, Paul said he walked always in the triumph of Christ Jesus. And doesn't he have to get permission to attack? Well, he has that pretty much. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, he's, he roams about seeking whom he can devour. But he's a toothless lion. Exactly. And, and one of the things, even with strong lions, I mean, typically, they will find the, the, the weakest, weakest. Yeah. among right. the herd mm -hmm. to attack. And that's the same thing is true here. He'll find, try and find the, the weakest. weakest. Right. That's yeah. right. That's right. So... The serpents and scorpions, you know, I've said this, Alice and I lived in Belize and in Central America, Mark was down there with us a couple of times uh, and lived there. When we lived in the bush, many of the times we'd wake up in the night and there would be scorpions in bed with us. Mm -hmm. Many of the times we encountered snakes in our little caravan, caravan. that we had out in, the, out in the jungle. I mean, either you get to believe this or you don't. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, please. Don't go there. Don't right. do that. But if you're walking in faith, because at, at the end of the day, it always goes back to faith. That's right. Do you believe? Listen, there's the account in Matthew. Um, it says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. It'll be done to you according to your faith. If you don't believe the word of God, don't step out of the boat and try and walk on the water. Don't go in those places. I'm, I'm telling you. Uh, find a nice, quiet place where you'll be safe, like your prayer closet. And get in there and get on your face before God and have a conversation until faith arises in your heart. You can start to live the victory that Christ purchased for you. Amen. Okay. Because you see, what you believe in your heart will determine the choices that you make in life. Mm -hmm. And the choices you make will determine what your life is. So. Okay. So then, he, then Jesus goes on and says to the church of Philadelphia, when you overcome, right, mm -hmm. I will make him a pillar. In the temple of my God. A pillar. A pillar. Now, uh, you know, a I... A tower. 
Well, I'm, I'm going. I was just thinking about Jesus is the cornerstone. Yeah. And but a pillar does not move. I mean, it supports the church. Well, and it doesn't move out of the building. Okay. Let, let's talk about that. Okay. Because that's true. You see, I've, I've read Pillars. lots of commentaries, you know, and I've been through schools. And every time I've heard people talk about this and make comments on this, I, I, it just doesn't touch my spirit. It just doesn't line up. Right. Virtually anything that anybody has to say about the statement is generally going to be either speculation or conjecture. And I'm wary of that. Now, I want to bring my thoughts based on deduction. Okay? Attempting to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Okay. And I, I caution you to pray about this, right? We know that columns or pillars have always been used primarily as support. support. Right. And to a lesser degree as decoration. Right. Okay? Right. That's, you go to any, look at the old temples. Look at official buildings. I mean, anywhere you are in the world, you go to the official government buildings. Yes. How common is it to see these pillars? Okay, whether they're there for support or decorative purposes, but they are support. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, we have to note the fact that the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the church of the Galatians, he says, almost in passing, that James, Peter, and John were, and this is a quote, reputed to be pillars of the early church. Mm -hmm. Galatians 2.9, right? Mm -hmm. So bearing that in mind and coupling that with the fact that here in Philadelphia, a body that the Lord finds no fault in, and is it's almost always considered to be the missionary or evangelistic church that the Lord opens doors of opportunity for. Here's what I want to consider, right? Okay. Let me give you some facts. Facts, Jack. Mm -hmm. Like Jack Webb, right? Mm -hmm. Just the facts, ma'am. Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, is, as Mark just said, the cornerstone of which the on which the foundation is built around, right? Now, the cornerstone is laid, and then they build a foundation around that, right? Christ is the cornerstone. It says that in Psalm 118, it says it in Acts 4, it says in, in, in 1 Peter 2, it says it all over the place in the, in the New Testament, right? Fact 2, Jesus is the builder of the church. Yes. A lot of, yes. I heard a lot of people going out and saying, I'm going to build the church. No, you're not. Jesus is the builder of the church. Remember when he was speaking to Peter and to us, he said, I say, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Right? So he says that Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, fact number three, the rock that the church is built on is not Peter, as some would have you believe, right? but rather his proclamation to Jesus that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. That is the foundation. That statement is the foundation of the church. Yes. Okay? okay. The Messiah. This is the promise through all, all man's fallen history is that God would redeem us. That's what, you know, God, this is not just New Testament stuff. In Isaiah 43, God said, I, he would redeem us. Right. And no longer call our sins to mind. Okay. So, the apostles and prophets who then brought that message, mm -hmm. right, the word to the world, were the foundation that the household of God is being built upon. Is that logical? I mean, it yeah. just makes yeah. sense, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what it says in Ephesians 2.20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Ephesians 2.20. Mm -hmm. All right. For God is building his, his church, his temple, with all believers who are the living stones. Yes. All believers. Mm -hmm. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.5. Mm -hmm. So all, all who are true believers are the living stones that Christ is building, but he's building upon the foundation, and the foundation is the foundation is those believers who, like the Philadelphians, mm -hmm. have been proclaiming okay. the, the gospel. And some will be made into pillars. 
He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Okay? Those stones for the temple came from the preaching, the proclamation of the word of God by those who, like James, Peter, and John, were faithful and persevered to have kept his word and not denied his name. That's what it said earlier. That's what Jesus said earlier in this letter. They were the believers who seized the opportunities mm -hmm. and boldly went through the doors that he opened to proclaim his name and his word. Right. Those are the pillars that support the temple. Those pillars are the faithful in the church of Philadelphia and all believers who are through the years have been like them. It is, right? That's, that's the support. Hmm. Then he says, when he, he makes them into the pillars, right? And he says, and he will not go out from it anymore. Now, we look at residing in this world versus dwelling in this world earlier in this study of the Church of Philadelphia, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that was last week or the week prior. Okay, the week before. And, and there's a tremendous difference. And if you miss that, you really ought to go back and look at it because there's such a gigantic difference between dwelling and residing. Okay. The reality is, from the moment we are conceived, there is an impermanence in and throughout our lives. Would you agree with that statement? There's, there's, there is a knowledge of it. There's a sense of our impermanence. Oh, right, yes. Right? Absolutely. It says that eternity is written on our heart. No, eternity is set on our heart. But we live... Listen, your, your experience is always impermanent. Well, if... What's that verse again? Eternity is set in our heart? God has set eternity on our hearts. Okay, if, if we know what it is, we also know what it's not. And we but, know that this ain't it. Well, the, the point is, very few. Remember when you're talking about when you're talking about Christians who know that and who that is the reality of their life, you're talking about a remnant. You're talking mm -hmm. about I'm talking about all of mankind. All of mankind has an an experience of him. Listen, you're conceived. Nine months later, pop, you're out of there. You're in the That's hospital. Permanent. You're in the hospital a day or two, and pop, you're out of there. And there's no sense of permanence in this world. No. Okay? I mean, people come and people go. Every, you know, I just had an experience this week. Uh, I, it, uh, it's life. It's a, a dear, dear childhood friend of mine that I went through grammar school and high school and Boy Scouts and everything. He just passed, he just passed away uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. And this is the first of my classmates that I know of that, you know, that, that I heard that's happened. We're not permanent. In this world, there is no permanence in this world. And, the, and we talked about this. The only solution is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. People are always seeking that permanence. Right. But even when you accept Jesus Christ, which I pray that if you haven't done, you shall do, you, you, you now live in eternity. But yet, look at me. I, uh, maybe I'll zoom this in one way. I'm sitting here rotting away right before your eyes. At least it's flesh. That's right. This is not permanent. Hallelujah, it's not permanent. Because I'm, I'm ready for a new one. I'll tell you what, when the time comes. I've used this one pretty good. This body is deteriorating. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, the thing is, we don't want to dwell on this earth. No. We're just strangers and aliens passing through. We're going to dwell in God, in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. He's not going to go out from that anymore. Um, there's an old American gospel song from the late 1700s that I've loved for so many years. Alice and I sang this at the funeral of a dear woman who I had pastored at a church in Sanford, Dixie. Right? Mm -hmm. And Dixie was dying of cancer and, and asked me to come up from South Florida, and she and I sat, and we made arrangements for her funeral. Yes, we prayed for her, but she was ready. You know, Paul says to live as Christ, to die as gain. Mm -hmm. When it is your time in the natural, you should have a perfect peace because all you're doing is putting off this old flesh right. and putting on that, that eternity, right, and to, to wear it. But Dixie asked if I would sing a song at her funeral, right, because she loved it so much. She wanted to celebrate the fact that her personal journey here on earth 
had reached its end. The song is Poor Wayfaring Stranger. Now, Mark can hum and sing it for you while I read it, if you, if you want. I am a poor wayfaring stranger, traveling through this world of woe. There is no sickness, no toil, nor danger in that bright land to which I go. I'm going there to see my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm just a going over Jordan. I'm just a going over alone. Hallelujah. You see, when, when this happens, I'm not going to go out from it anymore. When we cross that spiritual Jordan into the promised land, we will dwell with him. Okay, that's that line, I'm, I'm going there no more to Rome, embodies the words of Jesus here. And he will not go out from it anymore right. when we right. dwell with him in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. And then he says, I will write on him the name of my God. Now, interestingly, everybody, everybody will have a name written on them. Okay. Is this a new name? Well, no, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. Okay. Remember our earlier study here in this letter about those who dwell on earth mm -hmm. and those who only reside, right? Yes. Think about, the, the, think about that while we look at these verses from a little later on in this book of Revelation. Okay. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. That's the beast. Ah, right. Right, right, right. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the, in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Mm -hmm. Revelation 13, 8. They will have a name written on them. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, 16, and 17. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, with the bondservants of the Lord, the faithful who persevere, it says in Revelation 22, 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Right. Everybody want to get a name written That's right. And now is the time to choose which one it's going to be. We want his name. And we want his name written on it. Amen. And that's his promise here in this letter to the faithful mm. of Philadelphia. He'll write his name upon them. Uh -huh. Because Jesus said that. He'll yeah. write his name yes. all right, and the name of his God. He'll also, it says, and, he, and I, the name of the city of my God, the, the new, new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Going to be right. You know, it says that we are inscribed on the palms of his hands. Your name is written on Jesus. Well, that's what it says. Yeah. Yes, you said you wanted to know when that happened? <laughs> <laughs> At the cross. It says you were purchased with a price, right? <clears throat> you were purchased with a price. When were you purchased with a price? When Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross. That's right. No matter now, we've traveled around the world. I'm, I don't think I've been any place, by, by and large, where I, I buy something, I purchase something, and I don't get a receipt. Mm -hmm. If we were purchased with a price, did Jesus Christ get a receipt? Yes, He did. Absolutely, He did. Where was it written? On the palm of His hand. On the palm hand. of His hand. Every time they took that nail and went, pew, 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 mm -hmm. and drove that nail through His hand, mm -hmm. they were inscribing my name. On his palm. Your name and Mark's name. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they were inscribed. writing your name. They were inscribing your name on the palm of his hand. Hallelujah. Praise you. Mm -hmm. He's going to write the name of the city of his God, the new Jerusalem, on us. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north. The city of the great king. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. The new Jerusalem is the city of God. The holy city. There is none like it. The worldly Jerusalem was the center of the world. It may still be at this moment. It's certainly, you know, I mean, in so many ways, it is the center of attention in the world. 
and more, it will become even more so in the short, the near future, right? Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. This is New Testament. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel, you have, he said, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Throughout the ages, I mean, this is important about what's being written here, right? I mean, through all of history, when people realized the significance of names, people were known by either who they were descended from, or where they were from, or what their occupation was. Right? Mm -hmm. So now Jesus is doing all this writing on us. Mm -hmm. His name, the name of his God, the name the of the city. city. Right. Okay? These facts become literally part of their names. Right? Those things I just yes. mentioned. Yes. And there's so many examples of that in Scripture. Just give me a, I'll give you a couple. In Mark 10, it says, Then they came to Jericho. Talking about Jesus and his followers. Right? Mm -hmm. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples... In a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So interestingly, Jesus, when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, right. Jesus, right. that's his name, connected to the city. Right? And then he says, son of David, connected to his his, you know, his history, his genealogy, right? And, and by the way, Bartimaeus, remember the son of Timaeus? Mm -hmm. That's because Bar means son right. of Timaeus. Okay. So his name is literally ba yes. based son. on his, you know, who he is the descendant of, right. Right. which was very, very common. Mm -hmm. And by the way, today, still a lot of people have known that. I mean, you know, Francis, Francis of Assisi. Well, that's because that's where he's from. Mm -hmm. Um... Somebody, Peter. Yeah. How about Peter? In, in that most solemn moment that we talked about, when, when Peter recognized Jesus as the Christ and the Son of God, mm -hmm. blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, right? He said, it was my father, not in flesh and blood who revealed that to you, but it was my father. Well, see, Jesus, Peter is called Cephas, he's called Peter, he's called, right, he was Simon, he, and he's called here, Jesus calls him, right, Bar -Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah. Well, Bar Jonah meant son of Jonah. So that became his name. Right? Jesus was often called Jesus of Nazareth by friend and foe alike. And his city was part of his name, Jesus of Nazareth. So we call on the name of Jesus Christ. But Christ was not his name. I mean, that's not on his, it was not on his earthly birth certificate. It's his occupation. It's his ministry. It's his anoint. Well, that's what it means, anointing, right? right? The Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. It's his name. It's his ministry. It's, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I have an American passport. I don't have it in my hand, but I have an American passport. Mm -hmm. That is the single most powerful item of identification that I carry as we travel. <clears throat> it has my name, first and last. Mm -hmm. It has my place and date of birth, right? Mm -hmm. And it has the country that I'm from. Even you know, the city where you're from. It does well, it have your address? No, no, no. The not, date of birth? No, no. Or the place of birth? It, it has the place of birth. It has, okay. it has my birth date, all passports. It has your birth date and where, where you're from. Okay, mine just says uh, New York, USA, right? But it's all basically wrong. It also has a photograph. Yeah. The point is, it's wrong, yes. because it has my birthday, but it's wrong. You see, I had a new birthday. I was born again. But you were born on the same day. Well, but a different year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The second time I was born, it wasn't in New York. It was in heavenly places. That's right. They have down the wrong citizenship, because my citizenship is in heaven. That's what Paul said in Philippians 3.20. It also, I promise you, has the wrong expiration date. 
Because my new one ain't going to expire. It's forever. Forever. I'll not go out from that place. Everyone will know it when the Lord writes this information on me. You know, in some places it's good when you when you travel around the world. That it's good that you can say, oh, I'm an American. You know, that, that brings influence. Other places, I'll you tell you what, know. You, you don't want people to know you're from America. Uh, I lived for a while in the, the Maritimes in Canada when I was in the military, flying out of Newfoundland. Does that look like flying? Yeah. No. That's, that's what in really flew. bad weather. That's yes. the way we flew up there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I and I had a jacket that I had for quite a number of years. It said Canada on it. And a number of times when we traveled overseas. Well, you, that wasn't from the navy. Though. No, no, that jacket wasn't from the navy. Yeah. But it was, but it was legitimate because I had lived yeah. in Canada. Right. And I carried that because living in Florida and then traveling over to cold places, that yeah. was the warmest jacket I had. Right. And it was funny because people then assumed that I was Canadian. Exactly. And in some places we were, at some of the times we were there, that served me well, well so they didn't know that I was, because they were more gracious to non-Americans, non I'll yeah. just say that, okay. But the fact of the matter is, there's only going to be one place you want to be from. There's only one place you want to have your citizenship. There's only one place you want to have that passport from. There's only one place that you want to have that name associated with you, and that's heaven. Amen. And there's only one way to get there. You can't be an illegal alien. You can't you can't get there illegally. And there's only one way. And Jesus said, I am the way. Okay. Let's moving right along here. In verse 13, Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, once again, as with all the previous letters, we are admonished to hear what the Lord is saying. And this is in all the letters, right? Jesus instructed his followers to be careful or to pay careful attention to what they heard. We also have to be careful of what we choose to listen to. When all is said and done, there's only two voices out there that you're going to listen to. There's only two. They all, they all have one or two origins, right? One is the word. And the other is the world. Mm -hmm. Every everything you hear is going to originate from one or the other. That's right. You know, it is black and white. There's not this great big gray area in here. Jesus said, "You are either for me or against me." There is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Right. Everything came into being through the Word. Satan, who is a liar by nature and the father of lies perverts truth. He can't or, uh, he can't create lies. Every lie is a perversion of a truth. Okay. So one, as it's, it's said in the beginning of this letter, mm -hmm. right? The one that is the good one to listen to is holy and true. true. That's, That's what Jesus said at the beginning of this letter. Holy, he's holy and true. And the other one that you could hear is from the one who does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what Jesus said in John 8, 44. So if you're not listening to the Word of God, you're listening to basically a twisted truth. You know, it may be twisted a lot, maybe twisted a little. It doesn't have to... You know, I, I've used this example of I took on a, a really hot day and took a glass of pure water and you were really, really thirsty. How much poison would I have to drop into it before you wouldn't drink it? I mean, you know, I wouldn't give you a glass of poison. I'd give you a glass of something you'd like to drink with just a little teeny bit of poison. Just, just enough. Just enough. The very first revelation of, of that old serpent in the scripture in Genesis is that he was more subtle, more crafty than any other beast of the field. Right. A lie doesn't have to be very lieish before it is leading you from the truth, right? And remember, I've mentioned this, in, I think, earlier in this study. I've mentioned it in a lot of studies because it's the Word of God. These are the facts. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. And I mentioned earlier, just a few minutes ago, 
that David said, I mean David, a man after God's own heart, he said that he grew afraid, he trembled when he listened to the voice of the enemy. Fear comes from hearing when you listen to the world. Psalm 55, verses 2 and 3. So whatever you're listening to is either going to build fear or it's going to build faith. Now you may not be conscious of that because it is often very subtle on the enemy side. I mean, you know, you, you can hear you're constantly bombarded with advertisements, mm -hmm. whether it's on the television, the radio, billboards, magazines, computer. newspapers, computer, and, and all of these things, they may seem good. I mean, when somebody's talking to you about this or that or insurance or this or whatever they're talking to you about, are they planting seeds that will build faith in your life or are they planting seeds that will yeah. bear the fruit of fear in your life? Now, it's obvious that this church in Philadelphia was listening to the Lord. They were receiving His Word in their hearts and acting upon those words. It's obvious because they were pleasing to the Lord and Master. Mm -hmm. And without faith, it says in Hebrews 11:6, it is impossible to please Him. So, had they been doing anything but listening to Him, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have had that faith that's pleasing to God. All right, let's just do this, right? There are certain qualities in all of the preceding five churches that we've looked at that, that a believer who desires to hear well done from the Lord would want to learn from and emulate. But the church at Philadelphia kind of stands out as the shining star of, of these six churches that we've looked at now. To each of the churches before Philadelphia, with the exception of Smyrna, by the way, the Lord would say, I have this against you. Repent. Yes. And then he would bring to light their shortcomings. Well, that's not the case here. Right? No. While Jesus had nothing bad to say about the church in Smyrna, he also had nothing that he commended them about. Right. He just, he kind of, he warned them of what tribulations they were going to face, what they were going to come upon them, mm -hmm. and encouraged them to remain faithful. But there's nothing that he particularly commends them about. No. But by the same token, there's nothing that he finds bad, right? Exactly. But here, our study of this, the believers in Philadelphia who are pleasing to the Lord shows that he was pleased with them because they had kept his word, yes. the word of his perseverance. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And he was pleased with them because they had not denied his name. That's what he said. Yes. If you want to be pleasing to the Lord, I'm telling you, it's all about keeping his word. Obedience. And not denying his name. Mm -hmm. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, holding fast it. It is incredible what a challenge is taking place against the Word of God today. Yes. I mean, it's always been there. That's how the devil started in the garden, mm -hmm. by challenging the Word, as right. God really said. Right. But it is it is <clears throat> gone up. And, it, you know, I, I talked about somewhere in this study that those perilous <clears throat> last days that Paul talks about is satanic rage. Yes. And that's what we're entering into is that time of satanic rage. Okay? Those two things that I mentioned, those are the things that God commends in the lives of the Philadelphian church. And those are the things we should desire to exhibit in our own lives. Okay. Now, you know, the Lord showed Amos a vision. Okay, Amos, Amos the sheep of Tekoa, right? Yeah. And he said, summer. showed him a vision and said, what do you see, Amos? And Amos looked and he said, I see a basket of summer fruit. Summer fruit. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to him, you're right. The end is near. All right? That's a play on the words in Hebrew. Okay, But it was true because the, the summer fruit was the end of the, of the season. right? In these last days, let me think about what he went on to say. Amos was listening to God now. God had his attention. And, he, and the Lord said to him, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread, 
or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. Now, I believe that we're living in a time of transition. I believe we're in the last days. Yes. Now, you know, I'm not going to look at my watch and tell you. I've, I've been involved in the church. I've been saved too long. And I've seen too many people go off the deep end and start telling. There was a guy, I don't remember his name, but back in 1988, wrote a book. 88, 88 reasons, reasons Why yeah. Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Didn't I happen. mean, through, through times, throughout the years, throughout the millennia, there's always somebody. Somebody predicting when Jesus is going to come back, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that the yes. Word of God says you can't know. No. Only the Father knows. Even Jesus didn't know. That's right. All right? But Jesus also says, and the Word says, and makes it clear that we should be able to tell the signs of the time. And there are signs. And as we see those signs, he said, we should lift up our heads. We should be rejoicing. For our salvation draweth nigh. The end could not have come in the year I was born because certain prophecies had not been fulfilled right. that had to be fulfilled. <clears throat> I don't know how many prophecies have to be fulfilled now before he could return, mm -hmm. but I, I think it could happen. The reason I say that is because in those perilous last days, which I said, would be a time of truly satanic rage. The attack will be inside the church, the attack will be on the Word. Yes. There may be persecutions, there may be trials, there may be, but that's all to separate you from the Word. It's all about getting you away from the Word. Because all Scripture is God breathed and profitable. God formed Adam, created Adam, formed Adam out of the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. If you separate from the Word of God, you will have no life in you. And that's what Satan ultimately wants. He came to kill. That's what he wants. But he wants to kill you. And that means separating you from the Word of God. Transitions. If you watch any of the videos, if you watch, see movies or television or anything, you'll see there, there are transitions. You know, you go from one scene to another scene. Sometimes it's just a sharp ding. You know, you, you're in one gradual. place and they're all set. And then another time it's kind of gradual. It fades from this one to right. that one. You, right. You're familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be you could determine, the producers or the, the editors actually would determine how long a fade. I don't believe that there's going to be a sharp cut between the church of Philadelphia and the church that follows that we will study next at Laodicea. I believe it's a transition. Mm -hmm. It's fading from one and into mm -hmm. the other. Okay. We're in that, I believe we are in that time of transition. Yes. You know, that's the only time you've discussed it, well, the transition. Because, one, we're at that point. Because it doesn't matter the transition of the other points. And two, it doesn't, yeah. It, it, it goes from the, the best church to the worst. Yeah. Paul prophesied, Jesus said outright, and I mean, it's all through the scriptures. In the last days, while we're looking for a great revival, what, what the Lord spoke was that there would be great apostasy. And apostasy is a falling away. And you can't fall away from where you've never been. right? And, and I've said this a number of times because I just find it interesting that the number of his name, we mentioned earlier, this, the number of his name is 666. right? right. In the Gospel of John, in the sixth chapter, starting at verse 60 and going to verse 66, it talks about how disciples of Jesus, not just mere hangers-on or, or, you know, these are disciples. Many of them walked away because his word was too difficult. They dis disconnected from the word because his teaching was too difficult for them. That verse is John 6, 6, 6. And that's in verse 66. It says... As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. That's exactly my point. Yeah. So that, is, that it, verse. is it a coincidence? Because remember, those numbers, chapter numbers, verse numbers, weren't added yeah. for hundreds and 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 hundreds yeah. of years Later. after these the Gospels and the letters were written, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I don't think that the fellow that did that sat down and purposely Determined. worked everything out so he could get that to happen. Yeah. But it's just a, a, an interesting coincidence. Mm -hmm. 
don't choose to walk away from Jesus Christ. No matter how difficult his word becomes. Because there is nothing that he will call you to do that he will not give you the strength to do. There's no task that he will call you to do that he will not equip you to accomplish. All right? And that he hasn't done first. And he hasn't done first. All right? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. So I believe now we're going to make that transition from the church at Philadelphia, which Christ finds no fault in, to the church of Laodicea, which Christ finds nothing good in. And at the end of the day, I, I think that the, the study of the church of Laodicea, which we will start in our next session, may be the most important thing, given the times that we live in, that we understand what's going on, what the attack is. So I, I think we need to be aware of what's happening in the church today. Yes. That is making that transition from the church of Philadelphia to the church at Laodicea. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're yeah. back with us and for the next session. And if you know some other Christians, invite them to come and be with you or invite them to be with us. Yeah. Okay? And, and these videos that we do... They're always available on demand, okay? www.bibletalk.com And we really encourage you to write to us. Yes. Let us know where you're watching from. Give us your, your comments, your suggestions, um, your compliments. <laughs> Tell us you love us. Encourage or, yes. if you got something you want to get off your chest, write to me and say, what in the world are you doing? Okay. Or questions. Yeah, whatever you have, just... Feel free to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. So until the next time, yes. I just want to ask, Father, that yes. you would bless this word Thank in you. our lives, Lord yes. God. That, you, that it would travel from our head down into our heart and become the reality of our life. That your word, which is life-giving, Lord, we just... You, you cause us to, to live and move and have our being in you. Help us to be so attached to your word, to your son Christ Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you have chosen to put your spirit, your power within us to do that. How can we say thanks for all that you have done for us? But we will have an eternity to do it to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and praise you, and bless your holy name. So, until next week, I know, I always know, yes, you do. that my sweet patootie over here, Alice, wants to tell you, Jesus loves you. And Mark and I will say, a lot. So until next time, be open. Take the opportunities that God gives you as he opens doors before you. Seize the opportunities and be used for the glory of his name. God bless you and goodbye till next time.